And welcome back to our daily show where we talk about cool facts, trivias for everyone's daily knowledge. Welcome back, Joe. Hey, nice welcome to be back, back to me, welcome JR. To... Nah, no. Why? No. Oh, man. <laughs> Anyways, today we are on letter D now. D. That's A, B, C, D. The fourth letter. Fourth letter of the alphabet, uh, which is associated with our stuff of the day. So everything we're gonna be talking about. Discovery. D as in day. You know D what? D as in daily show. Funny da- daily dough. Daily well, dough. funny thing you said. What? Uh, something about discovery because I have something about discovery. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you can guess it, but uh, well, we're, I'm not gonna uh, keep you guys waiting. So let's go ahead and start with today's observances. Yay! First up is oh man, my my text on my my uh, notes are too big. Anyways, speak up and, and succeed day. Mm. It's two things: speak up and succeed day. All right, so created by the speaker and author Mary Ellen Drummond or Drummond, Speak Up and Succeed Day celebrates the importance of uh, being able to speak publicly. Right. Uh, speaking and getting one's ideas out there uh, will go a long way in helping them achieve their goals, whether uh, that be to grow their business or find a new job or increase increase their visibility at their current job. Because people really don't know about much about you, you don't talk, right? Mm-hmm. The more you talk, people understand who you are, and you have more opportunities given to you. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, groups and associations often need speakers too. Um, some include, uh, you know, uh, chambers of commerce, right. uh, church groups, uh, professional associations, service organizations, and uh, small business networks. So, like, public speaking, basically public speaking. It is. It is definitely. And uh, w- when you're up there, if you're, let's say, you're a speaker, a public speaker, you're not really out there or up there. Uh, just to speak something random, right? No, you, no, no. You, uh, what you actually do too, as as you speak, is you mo- motivate them. You motivate people. You try to encourage them to do their best, right? So it was like, yeah, motivational speakers. Mm-hmm. Uh, becoming involved in these organizations and speaking publicly for them—that's uh, what the uh, uh, public speakers do. Mm, yeah. Or speaking publicly in the workplace. Uh, which can go a long, uh, a long way to refine one's speaking skills and help them achieve their goals. I wonder if there's a... Uh, like in-service, Is right? there a public speaking for public speaking? <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. Not, you, you, you're training new public speakers. Oh, See? okay, yeah. To it's like a seminar, seminar for public kind of, speaking. Yeah, you kind of motivate them to be more confident Actually, on and, uh, how they speak with a, a tough crowd or a big crowd. Because, you know, I mean, speaking with one person... Mm. Pretty casual, but no, if you're no. talking about what hundreds of people, uh-huh. it's, it kind of, it kind of, you know, kinda, it would probably make you uh, nervous. <laughs> you know what the key is? The key is uh, confidence. 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 I, there's uh, one thing I learned from uh, a public speaker before mm-hmm. said that um, uh, for you to be less nervous, not not confident, but less nervous. Because you don't make it. No, 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 no not, not that. Not that. But you have to like. It, when you, when you look at your audience, you try mm-hmm. to look at them in the forehead. Yeah, you look head. at the forehead. Not, like eye contact. Yeah, uh-huh. Because since you're not really that close to them, it kind of looks like you're having eye contact, but you're actually looking at the forehead. So I'm like, yeah, it looks like I'm looking at JR, but I'm actually looking at his forehead. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. It kind of looks like you're looking at me from this distance. It, it really looks like I'm looking at you? Yeah. Uh-huh. I'm looking at your forehead right now. From this distance. That, I guess that works. I mean, uh, if you become a public speaker, right. you're probably going to be... You're, you're going to be further... Yeah. From you know, from this distance with Joe and I. So, so basically, just try to remove your uh, eye line from their eyesight. Yes. Yeah. Because having a uh, direct eye contact with you, you could make you nervous. Yeah. So yeah, basically, public speakers are also motivators to encourage people not to give up and always do their best. Mm-hmm. Um, to celebrate, you don't need to be an actual public speaker. Yeah. Instead, you can act. Uh, the way one way to celebrate this observance is to. Motivate a friend right. or a family member to reach their goal. So yeah. Um, How you reach your goal, Jr? I am trying to reach my goal by waking up early and doing exercises in the morning before <laughs> I go to work. Yeah. I mean, we all have different goals. So, what's your goal, Joe? My goal is to 
collect all the animals and insects in Animal Crossing. Yes. No. I can. I, I don't think I can motivate you. My goal is to survive a day. Survive, survive a day? One, one day at a time, you know? Small steps. Small steps. Okay. Small steps. There you go. Or to do something uh, good uh, every day. Hmm. Eat healthy. Yeah. Eat That's healthy. Good. Yeah. All right. Um, Next is nervous. Is talking about something good. Ooh. Is it something good? No. This it's is something tasty good. but unhealthy. Well, that's sure. Oh, but I mean, as a treat, it's something good, right? Yeah. I mean, when you say treat, it's not like something you're gonna eat every day or every every Should've part eat. of your meal. <laughs> what is it here? It's peanut brittle day. Well, it, mm. this next observance is National Peanut Brittle Day. Uh, peanut brittles consist of broken and hard sugar candy pieces embedded with uh, peanuts mm. and today is the day dedicated to it uh, there are other types of brittle or peanut, br peanut brittle in the United States uh, such as pecan and almond uh, but peanut brittle is the most popular um, many variations are found around the world as well where other types of nuts and seeds are used Let's see what I see I guess like uh Sunflower seeds, poppy seeds, poppy seeds, I would say. But I think uh, among all those, the peanut brittle is the, the most Pine famous tree. one. Classic. Yeah. Classic, yeah. Well, peanut brittle is traditionally made by heating sugar in water, mm -hmm. sometimes along with salt or corn syrup, to uh, the hard crack stage about 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then uh, peanuts are then mixed with the uh, caramelized sugar and spices if you want to add some spice in there. Right, right. Uh, cinnamon, limiting, cinnamon. Oh, cinnamon, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Limiting agents such as uh, baking soda. Let it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes butter or peanut butter are added to it. Well, yeah. You gotta eat peanut. I don't know, it's kind of like Flavor redundant because butter, you, yeah. got, you got peanut already and you're adding peanut butter. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, different textures, different textures. Different textures, yeah. there you go. The mix is uh, poured into a flat surface mm. and broken into pieces after after it cooled, cooled down. So that's the brittle part because it's easily broken apart. Mm -hmm. right. uh, if we're going to be talking about a little bit of its history, mm -hmm. uh, peanut brittle first appeared in print in 1892, but variations of the uh, candy have been around longer than that. Its creation may have been inspired by halva, which is an... Uh, uh, right. Arabic confection that first appeared in the Middle Ages, which includes um, honey, nuts, um, seeds, and you know, as their ingredients. So basically, it was uh, this was a treat that was created a long time ago, which mm -hmm. is recently in 1892. But it was the recipe is actually put into a magazine. I guess kind of made yeah. it official. Made it official. Yeah. Because, because back in the day, record, uh, you know, recordings are yeah. not much of a thing. I mean, yeah, they do record things like history, you know, uh, events and but stuff like that. Like, uh, it's not written down as like talking. You know? Yeah, like, it's, it's more generation. verbal. Yeah, more verbal. Yeah. yeah. So, and then with the invention of uh, what, pen and paper right. and the uh, the art of writing. Well, the thing is like this because of this, right? The, Recipe for the peanut brittle is more standard now, standardized. Mm -hmm. It's like you have to follow this specific recipe. While traditional peanut brittle, right? You have like f different families have different variations, different spices. You different know, how, yeah. you know how they say you can put different seeds, different spices. But you can't really have like one set recipe for your peanut brittle. Right. As long as the main uh, ingredient, which is a type of nut, yeah. is part of it, then uh, well, yeah, you have to have the peanut part and the and, and the, the brittle part. Yeah, brittle, part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> brittle part. Well, I guess if you don't use peanut, then it's gonna be the name of the nut plus the brittle. So right. almond brittle. Almond brittle. Yeah. Almond yeah. uh -huh. brittle, etc. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Um, anyways, do you like peanut brittle? If uh, if you do, or if not, uh, let us know. Either way, yeah, have in you the comment tried section one? below. But yeah, uh, it's it's a big thing in the Philippines. Really? Yeah, it's uh, if you're if you're uh, commuting or if you're traveling, uh, using the um, the uh, public uh, transport, uh, there's gonna be like people, especially the bus. There's gonna be like people who would uh, sell you these. You know. I feel like because like the Philippines is a more like, tropical area, these things doesn't melt that easily, like M and M's or other chocolate bars. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it can resist the heat. Oh yeah. Uh huh. So that's like, that's uh, why. Let's say you don't want to eat a big bite, you just break a little piece and just eat it. Mm -hmm. okay. So I guess I guess it's very uh though handy. I'm not really, it's a handy snack. Yeah, though I'm not really a fan of it. I mean it's not like I hate it, it's just uh, It's not your go to I, treat. Yeah, I would just go take a, a small piece because I mean the brittle part uh, doesn't really 
uh, do anything for you. <laughs> get yeah, get me, you know, to uh, to like it. Yeah, it's just uh, so, sometimes I would find it really hard, but I mean that was the that was the purpose of it right. to make it brittle. So uh, not too much a fan of it, but if you are, today's the day to enjoy it. Yeah, uh huh. If your diet allows. Yeah. And last observance is something that I'm also not a fan of. <laughs> But it's uh, today, National Green Juice Day. Really? You don't like green juice? Green juice are like so delicious and healthy for you. Jared. Well, let, when you say green juice, it, we're not talking about the fruits. Green. When you say green juice, it actually focuses on the juice, or it focuses on juice made from green vegetables. Oh. So ve- vegetables that turn into juice, or you, you know, juice them up. Yeah. So you know what the funny part is? Is like. When you think of a vegetable, you think they're healthy, right? Mm-hmm. Some, some, some of these green juice that's made in stores, right? They put a lot of sugar in it, so it kind of like offset the healthy part. Right, right. right. especially those branded ones. We're not going to name any. No, but. because like juice itself, right? It's supposed to be like sweet. But when you mix veggies in there, the veggies aren't really sweet. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, so far, the green juice that I've been drinking are still... Uh, or any any uh, what do you call this produce juice mm-hmm. that I'm drinking are still from fruit like tomato juice it's fruit it's fruit but avocado it's not juice green. It's, it's, not it's, it's fruit avocado mm-hmm. uh, well you can make an avocado smoothie but that's, that's not juice though. oh yeah that's true we okay. think of okay. juice so it's a thinner it shouldn't be thicker right more thinner yeah more thinner that you can like so it's something that you actually just blend yeah and then just make sure it's very fine that mm-hmm. you make it thin. The, the texture is like more liquidy. Right. Uh-huh. So, uh, you put green apple, make it a little bit sweeter. Well, well yeah, but, apple, but that's harder. fruit. Remember. So, uh, fruit, so just strictly green, veggie. Yeah, green juice actually is only about, um, at least um, majorly, it's about uh, green leafy vegetables. Or not even leafy, green vegetables. So yeah. it's not really to, you're not really, the purpose of a, like, a veggie drink or something like that. Make yourself healthy. You don't have to really need to enjoy it. You can just I, chug it. Just chug it down. I guess for people who can't chew vegetables, well, oh yeah, that's like, true. That too. I mean, I heard about broccoli juice before, but uh, I think Ugh. the common ones would be celery. The, the, the common vegetables that they use to uh, to make a juice out of would you know, be celery. That's one. Um, yeah, celery kale. Kale. That's another one. I use a lot of spinach. Kale. So what I usually do with uh, kale, I usually mix it with banana. And that's Okay, because I mean, bananas sweet. are sweet already. Yeah. But speaking to like. Oh, cucumber is one too. Oh, it's a little bit cooler. Yes. Yeah. A little bit fresh, more water. Yeah. Uh-huh. So speaking back to like broccoli juice, right? So you blend the bro- uh, broccoli and put some, uh, you know, some steak in there. And you have beef <laughs> and broccoli. <laughs> and we just <laughs> drink <laughs> it. <laughs> your protein and your veggies. The, tex- the, the texture's gonna get That's me. Convenient. No, the, I, I, I think the texture is going to take me off of the, uh, like, cause I, I know it's broccoli. I eat broccoli, by the way. Uh, but if it turns into juice and then you blend the steak to it. Uh, Ooh, do you like your broccoli steam or just raw? Either way. Oh, wait, no, I can't, I can't do raw because it's hard. I, I prefer some, I prefer broccoli to be softer than, oh. uh, than being raw. So steam makes it kind of uh, soft, softer. Yeah, so steam, yeah, or boil. Boil, steam, just usually we we'll eat it as a side. But when you have it raw, you just dip it in there. That's what I do. I mean, I could eat it, it's just I don't prefer it. Yeah, you yeah. I, I do eat broccoli. Yay, a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, you got one vegetable. Hey, come on. All right, I'm going to list. I'm going gonna, gonna, I'm gonna, to no, list the vegetables I eat. And most of them are green. Uh, green beans, I do. Cauliflower. Like, uh, cauliflower is not green. Cauliflower is like white. Okay, all right. Okay. <laughs> that is a doesn't count. Uh, what else? Um, spinach. I eat spinach. Oh, I eat kale. Okay. Oh, yeah. I eat... Uh, I don't eat celery. It's so, 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 so tasty. Just dip it in like peanut butter and raisin. Oh, I, I wish I could get myself to eat celery. I, I can't eat them uh, in a small... Cu- in small oh, dice. You don't like dice? Dices? Yeah. Really? Uh-huh. But just one dice at a time. <laughs> just... Uh, I don't even eat pickle birthday. No. What? No. I can't. I'm, cucumber I'm is like, my best. Cucumber is just basically water. You just eat water. I don't know. There's some weird taste of tasting. But it's only me, guys. If you guys like cucumber, hey, I mean, you know, my hat's to you. Jared is weird. <laughs> I'm not. You're weird, Jared. Anyways, let's move on to uh, move today on in history. history. So one thing that happened in the 26th of January. Today, right here, in 1788, uh, British settlement begins in Australia. Ooh. All right, so uh, in 1788, 
Captain Arthur Phillip uh -huh. guides a fleet of 11 British ships carrying convicts to the colony of New South Wales. Now, if you're wondering why um, they were carrying convicts or, I guess, criminals. They don't want them at meet in her. Well, uh, the, the main purpose of them going to Australia at first is to make it a penal island. Huh. Like a prison mm -hmm. island. Yes. Well, it's, it's a settlement. Yeah. I have to use uh, use to ex uh, to exile prisoners and separate them yeah. from from the general population. General. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, anyways, in October of 1786, which is uh, two years before uh, this day in history, the British government appointed Arthur Philip captain, um, or Arthur Arthur Philip as captain of the HMS Sirius and commissioned him to establish an ag agricultural work camp there for uh, British convicts. So Sirius is like the star. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know... Not uh, like Sirius, like I'm serious. No, no, not, not, not serious, but the star Sirius. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, it's the name of star, uh -huh. and that's how uh, people try to... Travel back then. To navigate, navigate. And navigate, yeah. you know. Um, and of course, since technology is not as advanced as today, mm -hmm. um, Cap Captain Phillips, or Philip rather, has little idea of what he could expect from the island. It's, you know, it's, it's their first time going there. Yeah, so, so they don't know the land, the yeah. layout, the land, or whatever. Yeah, everything yeah, yeah. is mysterious. Like, they, they don't have any idea. Uh, Philip had great difficulty assembling the fleet that was to make the uh, journey. His requests for more experienced farmers to assist the uh, colony were repeated de repeatedly denied. So to add more problems to his uh, voyage, uh, you know, uh, he requested for a, for more uh, experienced group, especially farmers, but it was denied. Because I mean, like when you move to a new place, right? You need to have some food source. And oh yeah, you need of farmer, course. You need farmers to make the food source, but these farmers are. Like, no, I don't want to stay don't, here. I don't want to be living among some criminals. That's true. Yeah. Uh -huh. Plus, I mean, it's already comfortable to uh, to stay on with whatever settlement you were you were staying, in, right? You gotta move your entire family too. That's Farmers, true. Yeah. Well, uh, nonetheless, accompanied by a small contingent of Marines and other officers, Philip led his 1,000-strong party, of whom more than 700 were 700 were convicts. Around uh, Africa to the eastern side of Australia, so, so they, there were more more criminals, more convicts than actual police officers and and, and, and other citizens. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. again, so it's three hundred to seven hundred. That's like one one criminal for every one normal citizen. Yeah, yeah. But again, the the main uh, reason or the main purpose is to exile these convicts. Yeah, that was that. But oh man. But now, uh, you know, Australia is a nice place. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, for our notable figure born today, Ooh. we have Douglas MacArthur in right. 1880. There we go. Um, I hope you guys remember him because I already uh, mentioned him in one of the uh, one of my daily episodes. Uh, also part of the history. Um, but if you missed it, well, let me uh, kind of refresh your memory. Douglas MacArthur was a World War II general who helped defend our country, the Philippines. Your country. My country, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not just no, <laughs> uh, The Philippines from Japanese invasion. Um, unfortunately, there was a time when Mac MacArthur was forced to retreat to uh, one of the cities or one of the places in the Philippines, the Pataan Peninsula, and then Australia. Uh, but he vowed to one day return. So he was actually famous in our country. He was famous for his phrase or his statement, I shall return. Right. So he's a uh, Terminator? No, because <laughs> Terminator would say, I will be back. Same thing. No. <laughs> this is more fancy. This is more fancy. I this shall is return. more patriotic. Okay. I shall return. Yeah. And then actually when he went back, uh -huh. when he got back, he said, uh, I have returned. And yeah, and then he, when he got back, he continued to... Uh, defend uh, the Philippines uh, from the Japanese invasion Japanese and uh, he basically you know was able to to do so so what I learned in uh, World War II was uh, uh, Douglas MacArthur right mm -hmm. he did a little strategy called island hopping so he built one island to defeat the Japanese and another island to keep hopping to right. in that area in uh, what do you call it Southeast Pacific 
Yeah. I think that's a good strategy. I'm, I'm not a I'm not a soldier or anything, but if you consider uh, protecting or defending or 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 what do you call this? Uh, well, yeah, defending, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, an island compared to a, a, a big, a bigger yeah, you travel a lot, you hop around uh, yeah. geographic place, yeah. right? Um, I think an island would be easier to defend because you don't have to worry about a no, lot of because you see the boats coming. Uh, yeah, and that one too. Yeah. yeah. So uh, later on, he became a major figure in the war in the Pacific, uh, fighting his way through New Guinea. Yes. Yeah, so the Macronesia, those islands in the bottom, mm -hmm. in the Southeast Pacific. Yeah, but I mean, what's he found in that area? Yeah, but I mean, man, look at the picture. Like he's got that pipe right there. Corn cob pipe. Yeah. <laughs> like I shall return. Mm. You know, and when he, when 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 I get back, you guys are in trouble, big trouble. <laughs> All right. Anyways, uh, now we're moving on. Place of the week. Um, for our place of the week, though, it's gonna be a little tricky because we'll talk about United Kingdom mm. and. When you say United Kingdom, you might, you, you know, uh, you might think about a single country. It's a collection because it's united. It's, exactly. It's, it's uh, like uh, America, right? It says we're United States, but we have multiple states. Multiple states. It's still one country, though. One but country. When, it, when it comes to United Kingdom, uh, it's it consists. Kingdoms. Well, yeah. To be to be exact, it consists of um, four kingdoms. Mm. Three of them are considered uh, a nation. Mm. The other one is not really considered as a nation. Right. Okay. Um, and those, these places or these nations are England, Scotland, uh, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And I believe Northern Ireland is not uh, universally accepted as a country. Wait, wait, wait. So, they there's people actually living on top of a whale? No, it's a different whale. Uh, whales actually with S, and it, you don't spell it as whale as an animal. Oh, you I spell see. it as W A L E S. Oh, well. So oh, okay, okay. So the people living in the uh, nation of Wales uh -huh. is Welsh. Welsh. Oh, yeah. the Welsh. Yeah, yeah. And then Northern Ireland. Uh, Ireland? Yeah. Technically, it's not part of Ireland because it's part of the United Kingdom. So it's separated. But uh, it's not also universally considered as a country so it's not or a nation. It's not recognized. It's not recognized. Oh, okay. All right, and since we have four for these places, mm -hmm. then uh, I guess we're going to be talking about uh, their national animal. Mm -hmm. Some of their national symbols, uh, they, they do share same national symbols at some of them, mm -hmm. but some of them, uh, they don't. So let's start, let's start from one country or one nation to another, okay? Let's start with England. England. England, their national animal is a lion. Ooh. And the lion, for them, symbolizes honor, loyalty, Courage, strength, and leadership. This is a weird thing because like, when I think of lion, right? Because of Lion King, I always thought them being in Africa only. Well, and then lions they're are being, everywhere. Really? I did not know that. Uh, and then lions are actually in their, um, you know how like the knight's armor or their shield? Right. They have the crest, the, the mark, the crest yeah. or the emblem yeah, of, of a lion right there. And then for their national tree, they have the oak. Mm. Which makes sense because uh, oak represents strength and endurance. There you go. So uh, it's a great symbol to have, really. The oak tree. Mm -hmm. like, I'm strong. I can endure anything. That's a good symbol. Yeah. Uh, well, you have the. Uh, let's go back to the lion. Yeah. So you have bravery. Us, bravery, right? Honor, courage. You guys, courage. courage. And then you have the endurance too. So that's pretty cool. All right. So. Uh, I'm not going to talk about their national sports because we're talking about four places here. Um, next would be the national sports probably be soccer, football. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Now we're doing. Uh, now we're going to Scotland. Scotland. But this is not a real animal, Jr. Wow, funny you notice. <laughs> so for Scotland, their national animal is the unicorn. Uh, first of all, it symbolizes innocence, purity, healing powers, joy, and even life itself. And as you can tell, uh, Scotland is one of these countries, or one of those countries, or nation, with national with a national animal that is not real. Um, but you know what? They have that animal that's not real. The Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> Scotland but, too. Well, well he, he, here's the thing about unicorns. Oh, okay. um, an interesting thing about uh, unicorns is that up, up until now, people are debating whether or not they existed. They didn't. They're rhino. People, it was just rhinoceros. People confused as a horse. Oh, okay. I guess you have a little bit of idea of this. Well, yeah, it's not real, dude. So, some scientists and researchers thought that the unicorn was actually based from the Siberian unicorn. Oh, okay. Which 
which looks more of a giant hairy rhino than a That's Lisa what Frank I horse. Say. Yeah, and to to uh, to show you guys the. Uh, I guess the similarity and differences at the same time. I have a picture of it, and uh, I'm, we're gonna try to go back and forth right. to see. So this is what the Siberian unicorn looks like. That's totally a unicorn right there. <laughs> uni, uni means one, and corn mm. means horn. I know unicorn. Uh, oh, these people it, they make well, it so fancy. Well, if we <laughs> if we go back here, that's right. the unicorn that we know now, right? And then this is where it was supposed to be based on. <laughs> it's like, uh, that's the unicorn when I just woke up. <laughs> and other unicorns just getting ready to go to a party. I have a He's feeling. putting up makeup and ready to go to a party. Because, you know, back in the day, they don't have any photographs or they have uh, cameras, right? So I have a, <laughs> you know, like probably some, some, someone tried to draw it fast. And it turned out <laughs> to be a horse <laughs> than, a, than a rhino. And the rhino is like, you know what? Just keep it. I look pretty like that. <laughs> Okay, so, um, yeah, so that's the national animal of Scotland. Yeah, this rhino is using Instagram filters, so I'm, I'm telling you. <laughs> Back in the day. Back now, in the, the day. Now, uh, the um, national flower, thistle. Thistle? The thistle is the national symbol of Scotland and is known for its uh, prickly tip. So it's like spiky, like a cactus. Kind of, like yeah. a cactus. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the thistle flower actually grows on spiny leaves. Mm. Uh, grows, grows those spiny leaves and protect against... Uh, being eaten by wildlife animals. I mean, you eat this uh, plant, right? You have a bunch of spikes poking through your mouth. You don't want that. You don't yeah. want to eat that. You're going to leave it alone. They still get... Uh, I, I guess, I mean, how it looks like, you know, a lot of animals will already kind of avoid it. Yeah. From eating. Um, this one represents nobility and graciousness. I mean, you know, from looking at the the flower it kind of looks like it. it's gracious and noble because I think the purple is a kind of like a royalty color oh yeah a royalty color yeah. right there you go okay um, so, so okay so we got Scotland as uh, having the unicorn which is not real nope. now we're going to Wales and for the whales another animal that it, um, didn't exist mm. uh, their national animal is the red dragon or the uh, Welsh dragon that doesn't exist. <laughs> There's no such thing as dragons. There's a Komodo dragon. Yeah, that's not really a dragon. It doesn't have wings. It doesn't breathe fire. What do dragons? Are dragons supposed to have wings all the time? Yeah. Okay. Majority of them, yeah. I was thinking about the. Because there are, I mean, two major that's, dragons. You're thinking about Eastern. Uh, Eastern uh, I know, the Eastern and Western, Asian right? Asian one, yeah. The, they have wings, they, but they can. Like this. Right, the, the eastern dragons don't have any wings, but nope. they kind of look more of a serpent, so yes. they're longer. Yes. But they can fly. Yes. And then the western dragons kind of look like this, uh -huh. or some maybe uh, they can stand in their two legs. Yes. Yeah. Anyways, also known as the red dragon, uh, this mythological creature is considered as Wales' national animal, hmm. and it represents pretty much. All things about whales, you, you know, know, from their people to their culture. If I was Welsh, I just put the whale as my symbol, you know, to just keep it easy. Yeah, the, but I mean, well, whales, <laughs> whales, oh. whales. <laughs> well, would they have whales? Actual whales? Probably not. Right. You can't. Ha well, I mean, dragons are not really there. It's not like so. <laughs> you know what? It doesn't make sense anymore. Just next. Okay. Oh no. And then, um, okay, so that's one. And then I think I changed. I forgot to change the picture yeah. again. Of the other it's one. Okay. Um, is it like an oak yeah, tree? It's it doesn't look like, like an oak tree, no. but their uh, national tree is Cecil or uh, Cecil oak. Yeah. So just try to imagine the first oak tree that you saw mm -hmm. that should look like that. It's a tree. Sorry, I forgot to change the picture. And then for um, Northern Ireland, lastly, again, since they're not considered or they're not universally accepted as a country. Let me guess. Let me guess. Ireland, Irish, leprechaun. Shamrock. Well, yeah, they got shamrock as their ah. national flower, <laughs> but uh, they don't have. So far, they don't have any national animal. What? Yeah. Hmm. If they do, they were they would probably share the national animal of Ireland. Right. Yeah. But uh, I tried looking specifically for Northern Ireland. Uh, they don't, except yeah. for the shamrock, which is, you no know, one knows the shamrock. Yeah. It's a shamrock. Saint Patrick's Day. Yep. And there you guys have it. So that's a lot of national symbols for uh, four places. Now we're moving on to stuff of the day. And our letter of the day is... Letter of the day is D. D. 
the staff of the d- 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 DA. DA. <laughs> DA. Let's start with the animal of the day. We have dragonfly. Ooh, look at these guys. Dragonfly. A dragonfly is a fast-flying, long-bodied, uh, bodied, predat- predatory insect with two pairs of large, transparent wings, mm-hmm. which are spread out sideways at rest. Uh, the voracious aquatic larvae or larva uh, take up to five years to reach adulthood. That's uh, that's oh, actually that's surprisingly long for a uh, an insect, actually, because a lot of insect, a lot of insects uh, have what shorter lifespan. Yes. And you know, five years is a long time for insects. Right. Uh, scientists learned that dragonflies are ancient insects, uh, long before the dinosaurs roamed the earth. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's why there were dragons back in the day. Uh, uh, no, not this kind of dragon? No. Okay, no. Dragonflies are essentially harmless. And even better, uh, these large-eyed aeronauts love to feed on pests such as mosquitoes and midges, uh, for which they can be, uh, we can be truly grateful. Uh, I like these guys are cool. Kind of like spiders. Yeah. You know, they, can't, they, they might be creepy. Yeah, just leave them alone. Yeah. I mean, they might be creepy, but they, hey, I mean, you know, they're eating those other pests that you you uh you like less <laughs> all right uh next is plan of the day we have the durian durian yeah i, I kind of picked stinky, this stinky 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 yeah i kind of picked this uh plant or fruit because uh i think who was it i think it was mia who offered me a candy and i said no because i'm not a fan of durian a uh, durian candy Really? Or uh, something made of durian, kind of like a, a candy. Anyways, uh, durian is our plant of the day, or rather fruit of the day. It's an oval, spiny, tropical fruit containing a creamy pulp. Mm. Uh, have you tried one of these? Yeah. Oh, so what can you say? Or I kind of like it. I like it when they made it as a cake. Oh, cake okay. Cake with durian cake is pretty good. You're probably not going to smell the bad part. No. If it's a cake already No okay. no, no it's just a flavor Yeah, yeah. Well I, You know uh, I was saying that Because for those who, d- who are not familiar With this fruit mm. This fruit is interesting Because it smells really bad But tastes really good so It's like, like Total opposite right there Airports would ban you From like bringing it home mm-hmm. Yeah it That's just so how bad it smells uh, Well If you want to know Exactly how it smells it, I mean Not exactly But at least The general idea Is that it smells like A rotten egg or cheese Or natural gas Mixed with cream cheese and onion. That sounds so good. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's the general idea of how it smells. Yeah. As for the taste, the fruit's flavor is a very pleasant sweet taste mm. with a texture and a color mu- much like a custard yeah, and a very like creamy, yellowish. soft feel uh, to the flesh. So, I don't know, I guess to sum it up, you could say that this fruit has a hellish scent with heavenly taste. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Remember when you uh, uh, mentioned discovery? That's gonna be our album art of the day. Oh, oh! Album art of the day: Discovery by Daft Punk in two thousand one. The robot guys. Yes. <laughs> I used to call them the helmet guys because they always wear yeah, the, the helmet thing or the robot helmet thing. Anyways, Discovery is the uh, second album, second studio album by French electronic music duo Daft Punk, mm. uh, released in March 12 of 2001 by Virgin Records. And I, you know, I tried to look at the uh, the logo of Virgin Records, and apparently it shares the same logo as the Virgin Soda or Cola. Have you tried the Virgin Cola? Is it the same as the airline? I'm not sure. Virgin Airlines. Oh yeah, oh, airlines, airplane. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you said airplane. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. So I guess the industry goes from uh, recording studio yeah, to plane so to colas. Multi, multi. Wow. So I didn't know there was a cola. There, there is, yeah, yeah for some reason. Yeah. Uh, it marks a shift from the uh, Chicago house sound prevalent on their first uh, studio r- record, Homework. So and Chicago house something. is like uh, electronic club music. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're still, you know, still doing uh, electronic. No, they do. That's their main genre. But of it's like music. It, it's not really like a lot of singing and lyrics. It's just electronic music. Yes. Yeah. Uh, like those, I guess they use eight uh, bit, sixteen bit on their instruments. Yeah, like that. a lot of machines. Yep. And homework. I, I really love that album. It's really nice. 
I do like their uh, music videos because a lot of their music videos are animated. Right. Like. Oh, uh, that's from uh, Discovery. Yes. Yeah, yeah Discovery. Yeah, from Discovery. Like you know how those anime. like. They have like four four yeah. characters. The all blue. Mm -hmm. It's like an uh, old 80, 90 kind of animation. Right. But don't get me wrong. I also like their songs. You know, it's for some reason a lot of their, their songs, even though it's electronic, it's it sounds relaxing. You know what's the most famous song from this uh, album is? Let me take you around the world, Jr. Oh, it's around okay. the world. Oh, one more around time. The world, one more time. The world. I think. One more, more time. time. Yeah, those two. This is a good album. Okay. Even though their uh, main genre is electronic, uh, they also are heavily inspired by disco, mm -hmm. uh, post-disco. What is post-disco? I'm not sure. So it's like uh, that disco sound, but more modern more technology. More oh, more modern. technology. Okay. More incorporation of the current music. All right. I'll explain this. Garage house. Garage house. So <laughs> basically, just like at home. <laughs> yeah. So you have like garage band where they play music inside the garage. Okay. Like do it yourself kind of thing. Oh, okay. So something that you could probably produce in the garage. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah that's it. And lastly, R and B. So a touch yeah. of art, rhythm and blues in there. So these guys, these two guys, actually produce a lot now. They I got know. they got really famous mm -hmm. because of these two albums. And like a bunch of other stars want to collab with them, collaboration with them. Yeah. They're just well, so they're, yeah, there are big artists that uh, work with them. Uh, Pharrell. Uh, Pharrell. Uh, what's the name of that um, Spanish guy? I forgot, but he, uh, they have a song with with him, uh, Casablanca. Julia Julian Casablanca. Casablanca. Yeah, 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 that song was really good for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, Crush, I think. I can't remember the title, but <laughs> instant, instant Crush, Instant Crush. Okay, something like that. I remember. Yeah. So yeah, there you have it. Yeah. Um, next would be the word of the day, and I finally removed. <laughs> the animation. <laughs> okay, word of the day. Dendrochronology. I gotta say it properly. Okay. Try my best. No, Dendrochron nice. Dendrochronology. There you go. Uh, let me spell it first. D E N D R O C H R O N O L O G1. So let's break this down. So I know two of the root words is chrono. Well, you know chrono means time. time. Logi, Logi is or study. logus is study. study. Mm -hmm. And dendro is probably like dendro is a, a tree or something like that. Well, you got so, it pretty much correct. So it's yeah. a study of time trees. <laughs> not, not time trees, but there's a, there's a reason why there's chrono in there. But first, let's uh, define the... Um, the word yes. dendrochronology is a noun which is the study or technique of dating events, environmental changes, and archaeological artifacts by using the characteristic patterns of annual growth rings in timber and tree trunks. So it kind of sounds complicated, right? So dating events mean you find the specific time, not how two trees go on a date. No, no. Uh, <laughs> so first dating of all, they can't walk. So yeah, they can't walk. It's like imagine if we have, we have a, a tree right there and there's another tree right there. Hey, you wanna, you wanna hang out? <laughs> yeah, I can't go anywhere. <laughs> I'm grounded. No, I'm, yeah, I'm grounded. grounded. <laughs> but yeah, but so really dating, dating event is basically like the specific date that happened, mm -hmm. the period in time. Right. Well, to make it sound more simple, mm -hmm. um, it's tree ring dating. Mm. Okay. They're trying to determine the date of the ring or at least the age of the tree by counting the rings um, inside the trunk. Right. So yeah. if you like a tree after a date, put a ring on it. No. It's not no. Uh, no. <laughs> but yeah. So each ring of a tree basically represents like a year, how mm -hmm. much growth they have. That's just... You know, it's, it's really amazing how, how people, how us humans are able to study things like this. You know, like uh, we are, you know, in a way, very observant right. of, of things, you know. You find patterns and connect mm -hmm. it and you realize, okay, each of these rings represent a specific time, year, whatever, how they want to measure it. Yeah, and but then you have to also consider uh, trees. Uh, some of the trees live longer than us. Yeah, but so, the sad part is you actually have to cut it to actually cut it. That's true. Yeah, yeah. we cut through the trunk. Because, uh, uh, by the way, those rings are also called uh, growth rings. Mm, growth rings. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. Like, how old are you? Let me see your rings. <laughs> Can you cut my legs to see how old I am? <laughs> no. Did you, you read my license? You know. Oh yeah. I'm, well, I'm, I'm 21 years old. Unfortunately, trees don't have any ID. All right. And last part would be the uh, back of the day. 
fun fact of the day. Oh, I forgot to remember the animation of this one. What, what is this? <laughs> Did you know that the world's first DVD player, letter D, DVD player, was uh, the Toshiba SD3000 in wait, 1996? Wait, we're talking about DVD player? Why is there like a twister here? I don't get this, JR. Well, <laughs> if you're wondering whether or not the background has something to do with DVDs, well, it does. Oh, really? Because uh, this, first of all, this is a movie uh, titled Twister. Okay. 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 Back in, what, 1997, which is one year um, after the official or the world's first DVD player right. uh, was released. And yeah, uh, this movie was the first cinematic feature film commercially released on DVD. Oh, so the first... DVD movie. First DVD movie. Yes. Oh, okay. So yeah, it was. It's pretty cool. Um, the world's first DVD player, though, however, is the uh, Toshiba SD3000. Um, That's a I weird name. Why is it called SD3000? Standard 3000. What's 3000? Why do you pick the number 3000? Should it be know. like 1000 because it's the first edition? I don't know. Yeah. These, so sometimes these company name stuff. That I have no, no you clue. Could, well, you could, maybe uh, a good speculation would be. Um, the 1000 2000s are prototype and they maybe weren't, they weren't perfected so the uh, until the 3000 why is it called toshiba sd is these things bother me <laughs> hold on <laughs> i'm always wondering what did you find out joe nothing because it's probably i'll probably look at it later it's, it's way probably too much. oh okay oh there's way too much information yeah okay. yeah yeah, anyways. This still had a reason. Yeah, okay. Well, anyways, um, again, the background is the movie Twister in mm -hmm. 1997, uh, starring Bill Neil Paxton, Paxton and, Ellen and Ellen Hunt. So, I don't know if you guys saw the movie. It was okay. Uh, it, I mean, it's not, it's not too great for me. I saw the movie. There's a lot of, uh, what, cliche script mm. or part of the script, you know? Yeah, yeah, there you have it. Uh, hey, we finished another episode for today. Cool. Yeah. And there we go. That's the end of our show today. People, hope you like it. Hope you learned something new. Don't forget to leave your thoughts about the topics we discussed in the comment section below. And as always, thank you. Thanks to you guys. Thanks to Joe for uh, co hosting. And we'll see you in the next one. I'm going to be excited for next week. Yeah. Aesthetic. Why are you static? What? Uh, Wait, why are you spoiling? Uh, elated. I'm going to be. Why are you spoiling my episode? Jared, we've been doing this for like four episodes now. <laughs> Scroll down what it is. Oh, you're seeing the pattern. Now. I always see the pattern. Alrighty, guys. See you guys next week. See ya.